bricked or they cobblestoned, then you had to start cleaning up stuff there. And that kind of became uh, the, the Bureau of Public Works. There you always see the uh, stereotypical, the guy in the little white coat and the hat with the push broom or the shovel there. Uh, they talked about the time, you know, how much, in, you know, like in tonnage per year they were cleaning up stuff off the street and like that. Horse-drawn transportation, especially locally, was, was really the only means you had of traveling and trade. If you had to move anything, any kind of long distance, it was um, to your advantage if you didn't have to go by wagon and horse there. Uh, but but uh, the reality at the time was uh, railroads, other means there just didn't exist. Uh, the streetcars came in in 1867. They were originally horse or mule drawn. Now, Newburgh did have rail transportation, however, and those were the inner urbans. The first inner urban came to Newburgh in 1889, and it was called the Evansville Suburban and Newburgh Line. Uh, it was built from downtown Evansville. It ran out to Oak Hill Cemetery, uh, to what is now Wesselman Park, where it split, and one line went to Chandler and Boonville, and the other line continued through what is now the east side of Evansville uh, on into Newburgh. The original line was steam powered, and then in 1905, it became what they called juiced, which means it went to electric uh, power, and they used the public utility electricity. There are advertisements that the Newburgh people put in the Evansville paper about how wonderful Newburgh is as a summer home. And if you can't go to Michigan, come to Newburgh. Uh, the doctors recommend the fresh air in Newburgh. And you didn't have the smoke and you didn't have the crowded conditions. And they always said you were within 25 minutes or so of your office in, in Evansville. So you could come to Newburgh live in Newburgh and had easy access. The, the, the traction lines left every 15 minutes or so. So you could have easy access to your business and still have the benefits of uh, uh, beautiful Newburgh. But away from the urban areas, you really had to have some form of personal transportation. The mass transit simply wasn't developed and could never be developed to the level that it was in Europe to service, you know, the dis Dispersion, the an incredible dispersion of, of the population. If you were going some distance, if you were going to Vincennes or somewhere like that, you could take the train. Uh, within town, within the, the county, uh, there wasn't anything until after the Civil War when the streetcars started. There was mass transit in the cities, which still you know is there and still is used. Um, but when you had that freedom uh, to also have, you know, something that took you where you wanted to go, when you wanted to go there, and not according to some schedule, that was appealing. They began to decline rapidly in the late 1920s. And of course, one of the big causes for this was personal automobiles. E.K. Ashby had the first automobile in Evansville, and it's somewhere 1898, 99. But there were an awful lot of cars being made in, at a very small scale Prior to that, again, late 1800s, the first assembly line produced car was the Curve Dash Oldsmobile, Ransom Eli Olds, and the Curve Dash Olds, and I believe 1902. But Henry Ford learned how to mass produce these things, or figured out how to mass produce these things. And then it really took off. Cars had gotten cheap in the 20s after World War I. The roads improved fairly quickly then, and uh, people switched pretty readily there. You could have your own car and you could go where you want it to, when you want it to, and you didn't have to depend on someone else's schedule. By the time the Depression hit there, in the, in the 30 or so there, hor horse was a rarity anymore in town. The Evansville Suburban in Newburgh ended in 1930, so you could then pick up the bus from Newburgh to Evansville uh, so even if you didn't have your car, you still could, could have access by, uh, by public transportation, uh, but this time uh, gas-powered public transportation. 
Well, certainly in the early days of the transition from, from horse and buggy to, uh, I guess, mechanized transport, uh, there, there were, gasoline wasn't the only game in town. Steam went out quick. I mean, it just wasn't really viable for, I mean, early on it was, I mean, people were used to steam for other engines and stuff there. So I guess for a lot of people that made sense. Companies, some of the first uh, companies there, vehicles in town were trucks, the brewery, different places like that. And uh, surprisingly, most of the early ones were electric trucks as opposed to the gas powered. And then the improvements they made with the gasoline powered engine. I mean, you get that in Evansville, you get companies that are making parts. They're early on, uh, the Zentmobile, the Simplicity, they're, they're making building cars already in Evansville by 1904, 1905, like that. Locally, uh, Graham Brothers, uh, they moved here before uh, World War I. Uh, they made trucks, truck bodies. Uh, eventually, they were bought out by Dodge. And in Evansville, you had Plymouths produced till 1958-59 before they closed the plant here. One of the big weeks of the year was when they came out with the new car models, and you know, they, they really hyped that, and people would go to the, the dealerships where the cars were undercover and they would reveal them, and everybody wanted to have the latest model car. Now, you know, I can't tell you what year a car is, as I see, I have a hard time telling you what, uh, what model the car is. I mean, the automobile is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. I mean, it did, you know, I mean, railroads built a lot of America and, and probably the automobile or internal combustion built the rest of it, you know, whether it's cars or trucks. For the foreseeable future, it's going to be fossil fuel and for a long, long time. And even though that is a finite uh, resource, there's a lot of it there. Um, we don't use it very effectively and, and automobiles don't use it very effectively. Um, however, that's changing. Even on fossil fuel, um, cars can easily do in the 40s and, and, and even 50 miles per gallon. Certainly hybrid technology uh, presses that even farther. Use the fossil fuel a bit, use, use electricity. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna run out of fossil fuel, but it is gonna, you know, there may come a time when it's prohibitively expensive to use it that way. Until something really happens strange, you know, abruptly that gas goes so high that you can't afford to drive, people are still going to keep their individual cars. I think we're, we're spoiled to be able to do what we want to do when we want to do it. People have gotten, at least Americans, have gotten into their individual I want to go when I want to go time. Well, there's, there's no question that burning fossil fuel, whether it's in a car or a power plant, has a downside and you know the creation of greenhouse gas, gases and I don't think there's there's no legitimate argument against uh, the, you know the effect that greenhouse gases have on on our climate and climate change I mean it's 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 hard science has it irreparably harmed the environment um, juries out on that uh, I, I believe and you know and I and I have a technical background that I, I believe that uh, it's not too late to uh, turn that around, but we have to change our ways, not, not, not only on, on an industrial scale, power plants, factories, and that, but on a personal scale, uh, the, the, way we, the way we personally burn fossil fuel.